All right, so here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Great chapter. This whole chapter deals with, and, and what I'm going to be dealing with tonight, the subject I'm dealing with tonight is this, this subject of speaking in tongues or speaking with tongues. And the title of my sermon is Tongues Are for a Sign. And, and I'm going to prove that. And we're going to see that 1 Corinthians 14 is probably the best chapter that, that just really encompasses this whole doctrine and, and what it's all about and how it needs to be used in the church and everything else that comes with it. Now, the first thing we have to understand is that spiritual gifts are given unto men. Okay, God has, you know, through the Holy Spirit, people receive gifts from the Holy Spirit, and we ought not to be ignorant about this. Look at uh, chapter 12 real quick. We're in chapter 14. Just look at just two chapters back in chapter 12, verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians. The Bible reads, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. We should not be ignorant of the spiritual gifts that God provides to people today. Now look, there are plenty of spiritual gifts, and he goes through a whole bunch of them in verse number 10 of that same chapter, chapter 12. If you want to jump down there, it says, to an, and he, because he lifts off a whole bunch of different um, spiritual gifts. And then he says, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So look at that and say, okay, well, it looks like this is a spiritual gift. And it absolutely is. And we ought not to be ignorant of this. But the problem is there's a lot of people out there that teach something that is untrue about what this gift is even talking about. So before we even go any further, keep your finger here, keep a bookmark here, put the bulletin in, in uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14, but I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2 because First, we need to just understand what is it even, what is the Bible talking about when it uses the word tongue? What does that mean? What, what is it, you know, we're going to see how the Bible uses this word directly in context on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 so we could understand what is it even talking about. Now, I find it ironic that we're going to Acts chapter 2 to understand what a tongue is because this is actually the, the place that the, you know, there's the, the Pentecostal church movement. You know, this is the day of Pentecost and this is the big, this is the reason why they're called Pentecostals is because it's supposed to be modeling the, 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 the New Testament church that was taking place after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and this great event that happened on the day of Pentecost. But what's happened is they've perverted the, the, the true meanings of this and they have something else that's going on. But we're going to look at this with a ready mind tonight and just see, let the Bible speak for itself. And again, put aside any maybe teachings we might have received in the past and just look at this with an honest, with an honest heart. What is this saying? Look at chapter, or chapter 2. Actually, I'm just, I have verse 4, but I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. We'll get this whole thing in context. We're not, we're not trying to hide anything from you tonight. Starting in verse number 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So just get the picture. You know, we have the disciples. They're all gathered together in one place. They're all in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. And there's this big wind whips through the place where they're, where they're meeting. And these cloven tongues, cloven means like they're split, almost kind of like a snake's tongue. It's, it's split. And these tongues are resting on them. And they're just sitting there like amazed. They're like, wow, what's going on here? Well, these tongues are, it says, um, they appeared unto them cloven uh, tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they start speaking, and they're using other tongues. So right now, we're, we're still, it's using that word tongue. Well, what does that word tongue mean? It's good. Follow with me. It's going to define itself in just a second. They're obviously speaking something. They're speaking with these tongues that were given to them through the Holy Ghost. Verse number five. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, 
devout men out of every nation under heaven. And this is an important point that we cannot ignore. On the day of Pentecost, there are people that have traveled, Jews that have traveled from all over the world, have all come together for this one, you know, for the feast, okay, for this, this big event that's happening at Jerusalem. They've traveled from, from near and far to come here, and they're all gathered together in one place. So people who don't even speak Greek, that don't even speak the language that the, that, you know, uh, the Jews would be, maybe be using, like the Galileans, you know, the, the, the disciples of Jesus were from Galilee, and they had their own native tongue. Their own, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself with tongue, but you can see where I'm going, because this point, we can't skip over that. Let's keep reading, though. After verse 5, it says, there's Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven that were there. Verse number 6, now, when this was noised abroad... The multitude came together and were confounded. So the people are confused. All these people, they come together. They're confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? So... Notice in verse 6, it says, every man heard them speak in his own language. And then in verse 8, it says, every man in our own tongue. It's using the word language with tongue interchangeably, which makes perfect sense because honestly, that's what the word tongue even means when, when it's in this reference, in this context in the Bible, not just your, you know, your physical tongue, right? It's talking about language and, and you know, the word tongue actually comes from because you're, you're using your tongue to speak. It's just another word for language. And what we have to understand here, these people understood what they were saying. Now, in the Pentecostal movement, what you'll find when people start to speak in tongues, as it's called, no one's going to understand what they're saying. Now, supposedly there's these interpreters, right? Someone who says, oh, I understand what you're saying. But never are they speaking a real language. They're never actually speaking Chinese or Arabic or Spanish or German or, you know, of any of these other languages that we have. Yet that is exactly what we find in Acts chapter 2. This is what happens. There were people, look, we have to put ourselves in this situation. Jesus Christ had just resurrected from the dead. This is big news. This is a big event. Jesus Christ had commanded them, look, you need to go out and teach all nations. Go out and preach the gospel unto every creature. Everybody needs to hear this. But the problem is not everyone is going to be able to hear it if the Jews can only, or if the disciples can only speak the languages that they know. There's going to be a language barrier. How are they going to preach the gospel to every nation if they don't speak all of their languages? Well, this is the perfect opportunity, and I believe God worked this out, you know, supernaturally, that he knew all of the events were going to take place. When Jesus Christ died, it was no accident. It was on the Passover, because Jesus Christ was the Passover land. And, and then you have the feast, and you have all these people congregated together from all nations nations under heaven, what better way to get the gospel out to the whole world than to have all of these people in one place? And on top of that, now you have the disciples who, I want to say magically, it's not magic, it's through the power of the Holy Ghost, languages that they don't know. They don't know how to speak these other tongues, yet all of a sudden, through the power of the Holy Ghost, they're able to speak things and people can hear what they're saying in their native language. This is what's happening here. And it lists off in verse number 9. See, verse 8, it says, How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Verse 9, it starts listing off all the different languages they're speaking or the different regions where they're from. It says in verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. They all had their own native languages. Now, in the United States, there's really not, you don't really come across that many different languages. You know, most people speak English. Obviously, we have a lot of people who speak Spanish that, that immigrate here from Mexico. But, um, 
by and large, the most people you run into in, in all the states are going to be English speakers. But in Europe and in the Middle East, it's not that way. You have these small, much smaller countries. And historically, now again, things are kind of changing in the world where English is becoming like a universal language. But it hasn't always been that way. There's, and, and there's still countries today. I mean, like for example, I come, my ancestors come from Latvia. Okay, most people don't even know where Latvia is on a map. It's by the Baltic Sea. It's one of the Baltic states. It's a real small country. Even though it's a real small country, they have their own language. It's called Latvian. It's a small country, but they have their own. Poland is right there. There's a Polish language, right? Russia is over there. There's Russian. And all of these other countries over there, they all have their own languages. Well, it's going to be hard to communicate with those people if you can't speak all of their language. And this is what happened in Acts chapter 2. These people came from all over the place. They all had their own language that they spoke. Yet, because the Holy Spirit endued the disciples with power, they were able to hear in their own language. So understanding what speaking with tongues, and notice the Bible says with tongues, it's not in tongues. Speaking with tongues is very, very, very critical. We have to understand that this is never talking about somebody and, and you know, um, I'll do my best imitation, but I've never personally been in a Pentecostal church, but I've seen videos up on YouTube, you know, people put them up of, of churches where you have a bunch of people, you know, speaking in tongues. And I get it, you know, they'll say this is supposed to be a holy thing and this is God coming down. But what happens is it's almost like a seizure. You can see people going, blah, 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 and they start just saying all kinds of weird things coming out of their mouth. But it's not a real language. It's not, it's not something that if there were a person from another country that would be able, there's no country that someone that goes to would be able to sit down and be like, oh yeah, I know what that language is. And I'll get into the unknown languages a little bit later because we talk about that. And that's what they'll always want to claim and say, oh, well, that's an angelic language. It's an unknown tongue. It's an angelic. But 1 Corinthians chapter 14 deals with all of that when we get back to that. We don't see that in Acts chapter 2. In Pentecost, we don't see people just just saying whatever in a language that nobody knows. They're marveling. They're 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 astonished because they say, "How is it that we can hear what they're saying in our own language? How is that even possible?" They're all from Galilee, and think about the the, the disciples, the apostles. It's not like they were these great scholars either. They were fishermen. Right? They were regular blue-collar workers. They were not these people that devoted their life to education and you know, they had all these different languages um, you know, learned that, that they were able to, to speak because of their own knowledge. This is something that was supernatural by the Holy Ghost of God that was given to them. So let's, let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 because we, we really have to just make sure we understand that you know, tongue, when it's talking about tongues, it's literally just talking about languages. It's talking about real languages that people speak for the purpose of understanding and getting the gospel out. That was the whole point of this. The whole point of this miracle was to get the gospel out because these people are going to be returning home. So when they hear the gospel given to them in their own language, when they return home, guess what? They're going to be able to start telling everybody else about the gospel of Jesus in their own language. which just further promotes the, the, the spreading of the gospel, which is the whole point of that miracle in Acts chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, we didn't read this whole chapter. We read 14. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he starts giving this order of importance that are placed in uh, verse number 28. So right near the end of the chapter, or, let's start reading verse 27. It says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So he's talking about the church. He's talking about the body of Christ. Verse 28, And God hath set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. So this is kind of like an order of importance, right? After that, miracles. Then, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. And diversities of tongues is mentioned last in that whole list. And this is another point that I find ironic because, look, I've, I've talked to a lot of Pentecostals and I've dealt with them. You know, I've gone out soul winning and I've had, you know, I've had people 
arrogantly say to me, well, have you ever spoken in tongues? Like, that's the most important thing anyways. And, first, and usually I don't like getting involved in arguments with people because when you go out to preach the gospel, it's not an argument. It's not a debate that you're just trying to win and show who knows the Bible better than who. The point is to get people saved. But the, the reason why I bring that up is because it's a mentality that they have of, of this escalation or the, the, the way they elevate this, this speaking in tongues. And I know specifically, I've, I have friends that have been a part of that church where they felt real pressured that they had to speak with tongues because that's what everybody looked to. And if someone's speaking in tongues, they must be a real spiritual person. And you know, we know that, that God's really using them and the Holy Spirit is working through them because they're speaking in tongues and becomes this big show. But that is not what speaking with other tongues was ever designed for. It's not a show. It's not to show who's got the great spirit of God or anything like that. It's not a circus event. It's listed last here. He says, first of all, there's the apostles. Then there's prophets and then teachers, right? People who are actually taking the word of God and teaching it. That is way more important than someone who's able to speak with another tongue. And he goes on to say, you know, even miracles, right? Think about performing. Think about if you were capable of performing a miracle of how we might think that's such a great thing. He puts the, the, the teachers and the, and the prophets before even working miracles. This is the importance because the importance is what can we learn from the Bible? The rest of these gifts that are given are all there just to help support the teaching and help support the, what, what's being taught and what we could learn from the Bible. But the most important thing is the teaching and the learning. Now, um, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 14. I wanted to kind of lay all that as a foundation. I'm gonna, we're going to go back through this and almost do like a Bible study on 1 Corinthians 14 because it's so important. And it's so important to see the, the holes in the doctrines that other people are out there teaching when we just, when we just can look at the Bible and compare it to what's, go, to what's actually going on. Verse number 1, 1 Corinthians 14, the Bible says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So he's saying, look, you ought to have a loving heart, a charitable heart to do, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 talks all about charity. And desiring spiritual gifts. Hey, that's a good thing too. It's a good thing to desire spiritual gifts, to be endued with, with power from the Holy Ghost, to be able to do these, these spiritual gifts that God has given. He says, but rather that you may prophesy. Prophesying is just preaching. Prophesying is way more important that you can preach the word of God. Is way more important than any of these spiritual gifts. Verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, this, this unknown tongue, I'm just going to deal with this right now. There's nothing mystical about this language. Unknown literally just means anybody who you're speaking around doesn't know the language. Okay, if I were to, I would venture to guess if I were to start speaking Chinese tonight, nobody would know what I was saying, including me, because I don't know Chinese. But if, if I knew Chinese and I was able to speak that, no one would know. It's an unknown tongue. It's an unknown language. And it's not going to do anybody any good. Now, is God going to know what I'm saying? Absolutely. God understands Chinese. God understands every language. God's the one who created language back at the Tower of Babel when he confounded their language. When everyone used to speak one language and God split them up according to their language and gave them different languages. God understands it all. So in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, a tongue that nobody knows, speaketh not unto men, because the men aren't going to understand him, but unto God, because God can understand him. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Even if he's speaking great things, it doesn't matter. He's not going to do any good to anybody. God's the only one that's going to understand him. Verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. And this is going to be the main theme of what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 14 is that, you know, when you go to church and you hear someone prophesying or preaching God's word, the point is, is they're speaking unto men for edification. Edification means you're building them up. You're trying to make them a better person, trying to give them more truth and to help that person. That's edifying. 
and exhortation, you know, continuing on, trying, trying to give them extra boost to, to keep going. And comfort, right? Strengthening the people. That's the point. Verse 4. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. And the only good that's going to do to anybody is just for him because nobody else understands it. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Verse 5. I would, that means I want, or I wish, right? So like I would that ye all spake with tongues. So it would be great if you, all, if you all were able to speak with other tongues and, and be able to, to speak these other languages. That would be great. He says, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Again, we're talking about things that are going on in the church. So if someone were to come in, let's say we have this great speaker, this great pastor, this great preacher from Mexico, but he doesn't know English. If he were to come in, and he might have this great message for us, right? This great understanding and this great truth from the Bible that we all can need to learn. Well, look, if nobody speaks Spanish, it's not going to do anyone. It could be the best sermon ever preached in the world. If nobody understands the language, it's no good. It's unknown. He's only going to be edifying himself and not the church. But this is also the case. Now, maybe you've been in church before, maybe not, where they have had a great preacher come in that didn't know the language, but they have somebody else that's able to interpret. Or here's another thing that's, that's popular, you know, um, and, and for good reason. Big churches oftentimes will have someone that can do sign language, right? So that way when someone who's deaf comes in, they're not going to hear what the preacher's saying, but there's an interpreter there to let them understand what's going on and what's being said. Hey, if you got a great preacher, if we, had, if we knew someone that only spoke Spanish that came in here, he could speak, he'd preach a great sermon, that would be great as long as we had somebody else that would be able to stand up here with him and be able to tell the whole church what he's saying so that we can all be edified, we can all receive from what's going on. And this is exactly what he's referring to. Verse, uh, where did I leave off here? Let's see, verse number... Six. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? The point for, for people preaching in church is to, is to edify you. So my job as a preacher up here tonight when I teach is for your benefit. Like, that's my job. That's the whole point. And if I just speak in an unknown language, it's not going to do anyone any good. I'm not doing my job. Verse number seven. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So now he's trying to liken language to, these, to, to pipes or harps. And he's saying, look, if it gives a weird sound, you're not going to know what it's for. Now, historically, when there's a battle going on, they would use trumpets. Right to give signals because you have this huge army that's amassed and it, and it goes you know, far and wide and you have a few leaders, a few generals that are trying to coordinate the attack and let everybody know when it's time to move forward and what you're supposed to do. Well, they would use trumpets because the sound can travel real far and the people would know what each different sound meant. So if it went like, da -da -da -da, right, charge, that's what they would do. You know that sound. The sound is real familiar and everybody understands the meaning behind that sound. And what he's saying here, he says, well, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, then everyone's going to be left confused, right? If they're waiting for that charged sound and then they hear, dur, 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 people are going to be wondering, what does that sound mean? What, what, what should we do now? And they're going to be left there confused instead of knowing what they're supposed to do. He says in verse 9, so likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. So he's saying, if I speak in, a, in an unknown language, 
I'm just going to be like a barbarian. You're not going to know what I'm saying. I'm not going to know what you're saying. And it's going to be fruitless. He says in verse 13, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So he's saying even if I'm, if I'm praying in a language that I don't even know, his own understanding is unfruitful. He's saying, you know, I could be praying unto God in this language because God's given me this power of being able to, to speak with tongues that I don't know. But he's saying the understanding is unfruitful. It's, it's not really good for anything. Verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So he's saying, I'm not going to, and this is another, you know, I've, I've talked to lots of different types of people that fall into all kinds of different beliefs when it comes to, to this doctrine of speaking with tongues. And I've heard some people that say, well, I, I only pray in tongues. I only pray with these other tongues. Well, the Apostle Paul right here is saying that, look, it's unfruitful if I'm praying in some unknown tongue. It's not going to do me any good. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. I am going to pray with the understanding also. He says, I'm going to pray with the Spirit and I'm going to pray with the understanding also. Verse number 16, Else when thou, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Again, there's that word edified. I mean, it just, just over and over again throughout this, this passage, I haven't pointed it out every single time, but the whole point is the edification of other people. And if people can't understand what you're saying, it's, do, it's not doing anybody any good. Verse 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So what's he saying here? It does no good for him to speak up here and just show people that he's got this gift of being able to speak with other tongues if nobody knows what he's saying. He said, it's, it's, it's stupid. There's no reason to do it. He said, I would rather only speak five words as long as everybody could understand. If I could speak five words that everyone could understand, I will take that over 10,000 words that I could just be rattling off in some unknown language some unknown tongue. But again, what is it that you see in these churches? What is it that, that's going on? Is this what we see being practiced? Is this the way that Paul's outlining what is good and what is right and how things should be operated? Is this what's happening for people who believe in this, in this, in this unknown tongue type of, of tongue speaking? I, I haven't seen it. I don't think that this is being practiced. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding. He doesn't want us to be little. He wants us to understand. He wants us to grow and know more about this. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So now he's referring to Scripture from the Old Testament. Where, where the scripture said, you know, with men of other tongues, so people with other language and other lips, will I speak unto this people, showing and prophesying the miracle that was to come, that, that happened at the day of Pentecost. And beyond that, where, where men were able to speak, people from other languages were able to speak unto this nation, right? He's talking about the nation of Israel. He's able to, to speak to the Jews, even though they spake a different language. And he says, even for all of that, they're not going to hear it because they had a stiff neck and a hard heart. Even though you, you, you know, they're, they're engaging in a miracle that this person is able to speak their language, they still didn't believe. And that's where it says in verse number 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So he's saying, look, the whole purpose of tongues, the whole point is that it was a sign. It was something that people who don't believe on Christ can see it 
and be amazed by it and see the power of God in it and say, wow, you're speaking to me in my native language and you don't even know my language, yet I can hear everything you're saying and preaching about God to someone who's an unbeliever. That's a pretty powerful presentation of the gospel to be able to do that. It really is. And he says that was the purpose. He says it's not for them that believe. The whole, the, this whole speaking with other tongues has nothing to do with people who believe. So why would we bring that into the church then? Why would we say, hey, you know, church is designed, it's supposed to be a congregation of believers, people who already believe in Jesus Christ. Now, do people come in every once in a while that aren't saved? Yeah, sure. It happens, and we're not going to kick them out, you know. Of course, you, you, you know, people are welcome to come into church, but it's, the church is not geared towards the lost. It's not geared towards the unsaved. So why would we make tongue speaking a part of our church if it's not even for the believers? It's a sign for those that don't believe. It's, it's, it's meant to edify those that don't believe. It's not, it's not for the church. He says, but prophesying serveth not for them that believe not. So, which is why church isn't for the lost. It's not for the unsaved because prophesying is just preaching. Hey, when I get up and preach the Bible, the unsaved world in general out there, they're going to think what I'm saying is foolishness. They're going to say, oh, you believe in God? What? You, you, you don't believe in evolution? You don't believe in all this other stuff? And they'll mock Christians and they have nothing, you know, they're not going to want to hear what I'm preaching about from the, God, from the Bible, but people who are saved, people who are believers, they are going to want to hear it. They're going to want to know, yeah, let's, let's hear what he has to say about the Bible. Let's learn some more about God's word because you're saved, because you're a child of God. That's where the prophesying is for. It's for them that believe, not for those that believe not. Verse 23, if therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Now, he says that word mad, it's kind of like the British sense of the word mad. It's not like angry. It's crazy, right? He's a, he says, look, if, someone, if, you have, if you're holding church and everybody in church is speaking with tongues, which does that happen today in some churches? You better believe it does. Where people just all around you start going into this, you know, speaking of tongues. He says specifically, and, and to me, it, it blows my mind away how this is so clear in the Bible, what he's saying about this, yet churches still continue to do this. It's like it's in black and white. There is no spinning of what the word says. He's saying it very clearly. He's saying, look, <laughs> if everybody just starts speaking in these unknown tongues and someone walks in, he's going to be like, you guys are crazy. What in the world is going on here? You guys are, are nuts and they're going to leave. He says in verse 24, but if all prophesy. Now, preaching, that means you're going to be preaching in a word that everyone understands. So you're going to preach in a normal language. And there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned. He is convinced of all. He is judged of all. So, hey, he could come in. He could hear the preaching of God and he could understand it. Now, all of a sudden, he's convinced of all. And because he could see everybody in here is in, in one agreement and they could hear and people are prophesying and he's hearing what God's word says in verse 25. It says, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. That is how the unbeliever is going to get converted. That's how the unbeliever is going to see that God is in this place when he can actually hear and understand what's being preached, when he can hear from God's word. That is what, you know, that's what's going to happen. And, and that's the whole point of church anyways, is for the believers all to understand what's going on. He already said tongues are for a sign. It was given as a sign. It was for those that don't believe so they can, they can be, wow. I mean, think about what Jesus Christ did. He had lots of signs. He went around healing the sick and raising the dead. And, and you know, he, he turned water into wine. He walked on water. He did so many amazing, he fed the 5,000, right? He, he did these great miracles. Part of the reason he did all that is because it was proving who he said he, you know, who he, said he was, the Son of God. The Christ who has come to be the Savior of the world, bringing forth all of these different miracles that he was doing just, just were signs that proved, how can you say this isn't from God? And he even said that to the Pharisees. He said, look, you know, if you don't believe, the, believe my words, he said, believe me at least for the works that I'm doing. You know, like, like how could somebody that is not of God be doing all of the things that Jesus Christ did? 
And that was an argument that's made more than once in the Bible to these Pharisees who just would not accept that Jesus was the Christ. And they're saying, like, how, how could someone that's not of God do these things? How can he heal the sick? How can he do all this stuff? But they had a hard heart. And the tongues were given for a sign. Let's keep reading through this chapter because there's a lot of information here. Verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. Everything that's done in church ought to be done unto edifying. So if it's not edifying to people, like speaking in an unknown tongue, then it shouldn't even be done in the church. Verse 27, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So he's saying in the house of God, things need to be kept orderly. It's decent. We have, a, we have a certain way that the church needs to be run. If somebody has something to prophesy or something to preach and it's in an unknown tongue, fine. You could get two people or at the most three that could come up and preach, but make sure you have an interpreter. Make sure somebody can explain what's being said so that everybody can be edified. Because if you don't have that person to interpret and you have one person speaking at a time, which we're going to get to in a minute, you know, then things aren't being done decently and in order. Verse number 28, But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. He's saying if there's no one here to interpret, then don't say it. So if people are speaking these unknown tongues, hey, look, you shouldn't, even be pre you shouldn't even be saying anything if there's not somebody there that you know can interpret the, the language. There's no reason to speak because you're not going to edify anybody. Verse 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. So he's saying basically they're taking turns. So you've got two or three prophets in the church. One guy's up there, he's preaching, he's prophesying, he's preaching the word of God. Someone else has something that he wants to say, something's going to add, okay, let him take his turn. The first one then can hold his peace, and now he can start preaching and prophesying. But it's done in order. It's not this confusion and people all speaking loud and trying to speak over each other. No. It says, um, verse 31, For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. There's an order to this. Everyone does one at a time. We take turns. Verse 32, And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Another extremely important verse to understand. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. I've spoken with people who have gone through the, you know, who, who said they've spoken in tongues before at, at a charismatic or Pentecostal church where they said, yes, I've done that. And when that happens, they don't know what's going on. It's like something comes over them and they just speak. And they're no longer in the driver's seat. They're no longer in control of themselves. They just do it. And usually they could black out and not even know what was done until someone tells them, oh yeah, man, you were speaking in tongues for like five minutes straight. The Bible says the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Subject means that the prophets are in charge of the spirit that they're speaking by. Subject means they're, they're, they're below, they're, they're, they're under their subjection, they're able to, to control it. When you have somebody that's not able to control what's coming out of their mouth, that is not of God. That is not something that God gives to people. He does not possess our bodies and make us do things or make us say things that we don't choose to say. We have, he's given us the Holy Spirit which can lead us and guide us. But we have the power to quench that spirit if we'd like. That's why the Bible says quench not the spirit because we're capable of doing so. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, our Bible memory passage, quench not the spirit. It means don't, don't make it so that you, you know, the spirit is not leading you and guiding you. Take the, the, the instruction or the guidance of the spirit, but we are always in control of that. So when you see these things happen and people aren't in control, hey, that's not a spirit from God. 
Because again, it's not God that does it. Anytime you see anybody in the Bible who is possessed or taken over, that's from the devil. That's, those are devils and demons that, that take people over to where they're doing things that they don't even know what they're doing. You see it all throughout the Bible. There's, a, there's the story of, of the child that the, you know, the father came to Jesus and he said, I asked your disciples to cast out this devil and they couldn't do it. And he said, you know, sometimes he's being thrown into the water and sometimes he's being thrown into the fire and he's doing all these things. Now, the child would never intentionally want to do those things. It's because he's got an evil spirit inside of him that's possessed him that's making him do these things. And that was when the, you know, the disciples weren't able to cast him out and Jesus said, this, this type cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. So he says, look, this, this, you know, this is a serious devil, but you could still get him out, but he needs to be by prayer and fasting. But that's a whole other thing. My point is that when we see these types of examples of people not being in control and not being in charge, it's always something that's of the devil. And right here in the chapter that's referring to people speaking with an unknown tongue or speaking with another tongue, it says... The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. God doesn't want people being confused. He wants us all to, to and that, I mean, that's the reason why we have one Bible. You know, we don't believe in all this different multitude of Bibles. It's confusion. People get confused. And, and that, that, hey, I talk to people all the time. They're like, I don't even know what Bible to use. Because it is confusing. If you don't know anything about the subject, you don't know anything about the Bibles, it's very confusing. You go into a Christian bookstore and it's like, well, yeah, what kind of Bible do you want? I don't know. I didn't know there were different kinds of Bibles and you're, and you're met with hundreds of different kinds of Bibles. And they say different things. So how do you know what's right? God doesn't want us to be confused. That's of Satan. That's why there's, there's so many Bibles out there that, that Satan, I believe, is behind why they even exist. It's to confuse people. So you don't understand what's, you know, what's real, what's the truth, what is God's word. <clears throat> it's the same thing with this tongues. God doesn't want people being confused. He wants people to understand what's being said. When the day of Pentecost happened, the people did understand what was being said because it was in their own native language. It was not this confusion of what in the world are these people saying. They knew exactly what they were saying. Tongues were given for a sign. Now, um, turn if you would to Mark 16. There's only two places we got left. I'm almost done. Mark 16. It's the last chapter in the book of Mark. Matthew, Mark, in the New Testament. Mark 16. Because in the early days, God confirmed his word and the changes that were made to the Old Testament using these signs and miracles. We have to, again, understand, you know, we have the benefit, we live in a different time. God's word is, you know, stays forever, eternally, but we have to understand why things were done and, and why we don't necessarily see the miracle workers and all the other things that were happening a lot more frequently with the apostles, right? Now, I do not believe that God is incapable of performing miracles today. I do not limit God in that way. I do not believe that God is incapable of doing anything and using people to do it. But there was a special time that was going on here during the, during the time of, the, of Christ and the apostles where I believe that God poured out his spirit abundantly and these things were happening a lot more frequently during this time, but it happened for means of a confirmation of what was being taught and what was being said, that it was from God. Because a difference was made. When Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead, there were changes that were made to the Old Testament. Now, not all of the Old Testament's abolished, but things changed. For example, the, the sacrifices, the burnt offerings, that no longer, that stopped when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. 
that no longer needed to be done because those were all foreshadowing and symbols of Jesus Christ who has come to offer up himself as a sacrifice. And, and, and multiple other things, right? The, the washings, the carnal ordinances, everything the New Testament line, lies out of saying, yeah, these things are changed. We don't really observe these things anymore. You know, the Sabbath day, we don't observe that anymore because it's been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. All of these things that we do, because of these changes, it, the, the teaching needed to be confirmed that yes, this is of God. Yes, this teaching is something that is accurate and correct, not something that we need to um, just ignore and say, oh, that guy's a heretic because he's trying to change the, God's word. It was confirmed with these, um, these miracles and these things that happened. Mark 16, look down in your Bible, verse number 14. The Bible reads, Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. This is talking about Jesus. And upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So he's saying these are the things that are going to follow. These are the signs that follow those that believe because the gospel was still spreading and, and, and things were being taught that the power of God was, was behind these people as they went to preach the gospel. And again, we see here that tongues is mentioned here as something that was given for a sign. It was given as something, as, as a sign for those that don't believe. Now, Acts chapter 10 is the last place I'm going to have you turn. Acts chapter 10. We're almost done. Acts chapter 10. So just to make sure I'm being crystal clear about all this stuff, the Bible talks about tongues. It's talking about languages. I don't believe in these angelic languages that, that nobody understands, and it's definitely not supposed to be spoken in church. It's a sign that was given for unbelievers. So when you come to this church, you're not going to find a bunch of people just, just standing up and speaking in tongues and doing all this other stuff that does go on in other churches because I don't think it's biblical. I don't think it's right. When we understand what the Bible's talking about here when it refers to tongues, it's just referring to languages. It was given so that people who didn't believe could understand and hear the gospel in their own language. They could get saved and they could bring the gospel to other people. Acts chapter 10, last place we're going to look at. Let's look at verse number 34. And we're going to see just a little bit more proof and evidence here in this story of people who started to speak with other tongues and how the tongue speaking was used for a sign to confirm new doctrine, to confirm doctrine that was being put forth in the New Testament as was the whole purpose for the, for the tongues to begin with. So let's start reading in verse number 34. The Bible reads, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, 
The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So, kind of a long story. I know I read through this whole thing without really expounding on it. But what happened was Peter was, was received a vision. Before these men came and brought him to Cornelius, you know, this, this Italian band, Cornelius had his own vision. And they, you know, the, the Lord told him, hey, call for Peter. Call for Peter to be sent to you, and he's going to tell you what you need to know. Well, Peter was over here, and he's, you know, he's up on the roof, and he's fasting, and he sees this great vision of all these animals being let down from heaven, kind of like in a, in a big balloon, right? And, and, and they're being let down heaven, and, and he hears a voice say, you know, take Peter, kill and eat. But there are all these unclean beasts, right? So in the, in the Old Testament, there were certain animals, like they couldn't eat pig, they couldn't eat all different types of animals. And these unclean animals he saw in his vision, and he hears a voice telling him to eat. And he says, not so, Lord. You know, I've never, I've never eaten un anything unclean. I've, I've obeyed that command. I'm not going to eat those. And it happened three times where it said, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common or unclean. So God is, is, is revealing unto him that that dietary restriction that the Jews had is no longer necessary. You don't have to follow that dietary law anymore. But there was more meaning to that besides just the food just what type of animals were unclean because the Jews perceived everybody who was not a Jew, the Gentiles, as being unclean, as being these heathen, of people that they were better than. And, and it was an attitude that they had. You read through the Bible, you'll see this. It's clear. They thought they were better than the Gentiles. They would not so much as eat with the Gentiles. They would stand up and, you know, and refuse them and not speak with them. But God is trying to reveal unto Peter not just the dietary restriction thing, but that God is opening up the doors to everybody. He's opening up the doors of Gentiles and everybody else so that he goes, when he's called to go unto this Italian band, he goes to them and now he's starting to understand what this whole vision was about. And he's saying, oh, okay, yeah, you know, these men aren't unclean. I need to preach the gospel to them too. So as he starts to preach Jesus unto them, the Holy Ghost, they believe. They believe on Christ. He's preaching Christ and Him crucified unto these people. They believe the Holy Ghost comes on them. And they're starting now to be able to speak with another tongue, with another language. And he sees this, and he, he knows the, the power of God. He sees that this is them speaking with another tongue, and he's saying, wow. He's astonished. And he says, you know, these are Gentiles, and they're able to speak with other tongues now, too. And then he says, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? He's saying, well, wait. I mean, they obviously believe because God's pouring out his Holy Ghost upon them. So can any man forbid them to be baptized? Well, of course, let's get them baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as me. Now, this is the last point I just, you know, I turned here because... Overall, what, you know, the, 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 main, the main doctrine that's false that's out there comes from the Pentecostal church. There's really no other churches that I know of that, are, that, that use this, you know, speaking in tongues and, um, you know, the way that they do and, and under, try to understand it the way that they do and teach it the way that they do. But this also, this passage also touches on another false doctrine they have about, you know, they'll say that you can't get the Holy Ghost until you're baptized. Yet here we see a clear example of people who got the Holy Ghost and they weren't even baptized yet. When we're confronted with doctrines, we need to be able to make sure that we go and search the scriptures and see if it lines up with what the Bible says. Everything that I teach, I would expect you to go back and to look through the Bible and make sure, does this line up? Does this make sense? Is that what the Bible is actually saying? Is there some more thing somewhere else that contradicts what is being preached, what is being taught? 
And you have to look it up for yourself because God ultimately is going to hold us all responsible for our own beliefs. You can't just blame everything on some preacher that, that taught you the wrong thing. We have to take it upon ourselves to know his word. And you know what? That takes work. It takes effort. That means you have to take this book and read it regularly on your own in order to, to not be deceived. Most people won't do that. Most people like to be spoon-fed, and that's why there's so many big churches that preach all kinds of false doctrines, and no one has any idea any different, because they have a fast-talking preacher that's able to tell them things that may sound good, and things that they might like to hear, and it might look like they got the power of God, because they got these people doing all kinds of weird things, and speaking in these weird languages and stuff, and you got the preacher telling them that, that that's the power of God, and praise the Lord, and everyone's jumping up, and putting their hands up in the air, and saying, this is great, and nobody's reading the scripture. And, and challenging and saying, is this of God? Is this what we find in the Bible? Because it's not. This is not what the Bible teaches. The sign of the Gentiles in that last chapter, in Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles being able to speak with other tongues. Again, it was given for a sign to confirm the words that Peter had heard in the vision that he had about the Gentiles being able to receive God's word and to take part in the ministry and be used of God with the Holy Ghost. That it's not just the nation of Israel that was being used anymore because God has now opened it up to use people of all nations. And the, that sign that Peter saw of them speaking with other tongues confirmed God's word. It confirmed it to him, and that was the right teaching that he was given. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear teachings of the Bible. Lord, I pray that you would please just um, help me continue to, to try to elaborate and, and to break down your words in a way that everyone could understand, dear Lord. And, and they're not, it's not that they're difficult, dear God. We know that you are not the author of confusion. You do not want us confused about any of these topics. The problem is we have a lot of other teachers out there and, and pastors that will teach different things and it becomes confusing to us especially when people when we don't know your word god i pray that you would please stir up our spirits that we would take it upon ourselves and take the initiative to read the bible and to read your words and that we can be led ultimately by you and that you would lead us into all knowledge and all understanding dear god i pray that you please help us not to be deceived by by the by the slick, fast-talking preachers, dear Lord, but that you would help us to just analyze and scrutinize everything that, that we hear. We thank you for your clear words and the teachings and especially for, for the many gifts that you've given us, but most importantly, the gift of salvation, dear God. And I pray that you would please just bless our church, bless everyone here tonight, and help us continue to grow and do a great work for you to bring honor and glory unto your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.